Welcome to Rules of the Pit. Tonight is our inaugural show, and we have special guest who has graciously given up his time to sit around and shoot the shit with us. A man who encouraged changing our sheets, drinking copious amounts of coffee, has given us the background music to our lives. A man whose voice and band influenced an entire genre, punk rock, and has become the base ingredient of the majority of California punk rock sound. A man who probably no, needs no introduction, but here he is, Dr. Milo Ackerman. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Welcome. Welcome, Milo. How's it going, everybody? How is this good, evening? Good. Good. Going good. All right, Milo. I'm gonna I'm gonna kick us off. I'm Ryan. Um, I want to bring us up to the the latest release from the Descendants. So on Ninth and Walnut, you guys went way back to songs that were written before you joined the band. What was it like singing those songs? Well, I I like to put myself back in that time because uh, it was such a for me, just such a eye-opening experience when I went through it. Bill, Bill, the drummer, uh, came to school with these singles, which were uh, which was "Ride the Wild." I mean, and we were in high school together, and then he uh, he would uh, he, he would sell those singles at school, and I, I bought one from him, and I and uh, it was it just kind of blew my mind. So then I asked him if I could come see them practice. And he said, sure. And so I went to go see them practice. So when I went to go see them practice uh, at the church, they uh, they played Ride the Wild, of course. They played the two songs from the single. So I was like, oh, this is great. You know, I get to hear those two songs. But then they played all this other stuff. And it just it was like, whoa, they have a bunch of other really killer songs. Um, and what ended up happening is that, is that when I joined the band, I said, hey, can I sing some of these other songs too and they said oh i think some of those yeah but some of the some of them were just dropped from the set by the time i joined they'd actually dropped from the set so the stuff on ninth and walnut about half those songs were songs that i did sing with the band back in the day and the other half were songs that they'd already dropped out of the set and so that the the point of the story is that is that when i when i got around to doing the ninth and walnut songs you know in the here and now I felt like, oh, this is my first chance to do, uh, my first chance to do um, Last of the Mohicans, you know, which is a song in that record. And I thought that was a song, one of the songs that Frank wrote that I loved, never had a chance to do it back then because they'd already dropped it out of the set. So that was my main, my main kind of like impetus for, for doing Night the Wall. Like, oh, great. I get to do all these songs that I remembered back from then that I never had a chance to do. Now, and then the follow-up question is always going to be, well, why did they drop them out of the set as soon as I joined? And it's probably because I didn't know how to sing. And so uh, I think, you know, I think I, I joined and they thought, well, let's let's not do the real, like, you know, melodic croony songs because he's not going to be able to do those. So that was part of my other impetus for doing Night the Walnut is that, like, I wanted to prove to them that now I could do it, you know, 40 years later. So that's... Oh, yeah. That's that. So I think it worked and it worked out great because I, I it was a trip down memory lane for me. And I also got to do those. I got to do the songs I didn't get to do back then because I dropped them. And I got to do the other songs that I did get to do back then, but give them an extra kind of like oomph because now I know how to sing better. So it was a great experience. That's awesome. Um, generally speaking, um, like, you know, usually people in the front man position like you are like they've usually got pretty big egos um and you know they're they've always had that drive for the spotlight and i know that you know the the way you came into the band you know you, you probably had a little bit of drive for you know hey let me sing for you right <laughs> like let me be a part of this but to me and and knowing you know you you went to school and whatnot it, it wasn't really your drive so like how does one going from just hanging out with your buddies to being basically a legend in a ton of people's minds my own um for being the front man of one of the biggest punk bands in the world 
Well, like I said, I I I was I went to go see them practice because I listened to that first single, and I think part of me was also at that point starting to kind of uh, break out of my shell a little bit. I mean, I was uh, especially as a junior and sophomore in in high school, I was pretty much a the wallflower, the wallflower type, just kind of like hanging back, you know, and I, and I, I had my, my crew of people, but I, I didn't really feel like I, I, I was kind of right, riding under the, under the, under the radar. And then at some point I just decided, fuck, I just, I should just be myself. Who am I? I'm a nerd. I'm just going to be who I am. And I think that kind of dovetailed or coincided with, you know, going to see the descendants practice and realizing well, it's a great way to break out of your shell if you just if you just join this band. And and when they when they offered to let me play, I offered to let me sing. I thought, well, you know, then maybe this is the thing that'll do it. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of like you know jumping in head first, you know, into the whole thing, just uh, without you know without even looking to see how deep the water was. You know, it's going to do it. And uh, yeah, I was kind of I would say. Uh, uh, a little bit of a trial by fire and pretty rough to start with because I wasn't, I was a shy kid. And, you know, as a front man, that doesn't really necessarily go over that well. Uh, So I think for a while there, I think the first couple of shows, I was pretty much like staring at the ground. Uh, And then I guess after a while, you know, you, especially we were all pretty much like-minded, like it's all about the music. And we just wanted, we wanted to kind of, to kind of give the music what it, what it needed and, and just kind of let the music carry us to wherever it was going to carry us. And for me, I just let the music carry me into almost a different persona in a certain sense, because, you know, when I get on stage now, you don't see that shy person anymore. You see, you know, you know, someone else like a, you know, cage animal. No, but never. Uh, no, but I think, uh, you, I think it took me a while to kind of to kind of get over that shyness, and then I just kind of I do I do kind of get into the role and just kind of like, like drinking lots of coffee helps for that as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, I I can definitely relate with that. I'm uh, I'm a very antisocial guy, believe it or not, and, and punk's good I, for you. <laughs> it is it is um and i'm a musician as well i i play guitar and in the band and with without my band i could never be in front of anybody but over the years having them there like it feels good to get out there yeah and i but i couldn't imagine not having them with me because that's not me right but i put on the persona yeah and i become this alter ego of myself that is completely different and everybody knows who the real trevor is um and i become fletcher (laughs) not pennywise obviously um and uh and you know i take on that persona and and i agree you know like for for and i've always been kind of nerdy you know like hung out with cool kids like well to me they were cool kids they were the ones who played guitar and shit like that (laughs) but I was always kind of trying to find myself too and and part of it is that you find your you find yourself with the people other people who are trying to find themselves too I mean we were all like-minded that way I mean Bill Bill was very much the same way the total like social outcast of a sort and so then it becomes the, you know, like the three musketeers or in our case, the four musketeers. And we're just like, you know, we, we banded together to kind of shake our fists at all the popular kids and, and say, yeah. we, don't need, we don't need you. And we've got, we've got us. And, and yeah, that, that's, that's where a lot of the energy comes from. And that's probably how you can bust out of the shell more. It's because you, you're just kind of, you've got something to kind of rail against on some level. And, and you've also got yeah. cr- your crew backing you up your too. Crew. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You remember your first show? Like what? Do you remember how you felt that first time you stood in front of an audience and tried to do this? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was uh, I think like the first show. Was in this place in Long Beach. 
it was actually we practiced in, in with the Stingers, a band from Long Beach. Uh, they the Stingers uh, practice room, and they were throwing a party, and they said, "Hey, you guys should play." And yeah, I kind of feel like I, I you know, the, I felt like I was uh, in in a room full of I don't know people judging me. You know, people are all, and so I just kind of like stuck my head down and did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it was like. Uh, didn't it I was not a natural kind of showman and so I just kind of uh I got through the set and you know I think it took me a few shows to even emote to even kind of emote to the audience to just kind of get all that out there and then right. they got easier at that point but uh yeah not a natural showman not a natural singer not a natural performer but the music meant so much to me that I just kind of thought I'm just going to push through this even though I'm really feeling like I want to crawl into a hole, I'm just going to get out there and do it because it was, to me, it was all about the music. Right. So that's, that's, that was the good news is that it doesn't matter how, how it, uncomfortable and awkward I felt the music made it all kind of worthwhile. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, Milo, you mentioned that a little earlier that, you know, like, like I was a nerd, you know, like, and that makes me happy to hear because, like, you should see the comic book collection I got out in the garage, man. It's uh, along with all my uh, Hot Wheels cars and stuff like that. But, <laughs> like, that in that vein, um, I love a good, like, uh, comic book origin story. Like, uh, when I found out about, like, Wolverine being over, like, 150 years old or, um, you know, um, just, just finding out, you know, like, stuff I didn't know, like, the minutiae and stuff like that. Like, um what is uh what, what what's your punk rock origin story if we all have one uh you let's see oh like how i got into punk or or how yeah like where where did it all start like oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah well i was i was uh i kind of came through new the new wave side of things like i was a new waver or you know that, at least i got in the new wave uh, before I got into punk. And so I was listening to the Devo and the B-52s and, and then, um, you know, I, I pretty much hadn't really heard any punk. I mean, you hear Ramones on the radio and so you go, yeah, cool. Ramones are cool. But I hadn't really heard any of the, like the hardcore music around. I actually saw Black Flag play at, at Pollywog Park. It was one of their early shows. This would have been in 79. Wow. And but I was just showing up because I'd, I'd heard of them. So I thought, here's this local band. I should check them out. But I, it, I, it went over my head. I couldn't, I was still like that new wave kid. So I, I, I didn't really have this like mind blowing or life changing kind of effect on me. Um, but what did is when I went to go see Devo play and X opened up and I was there to see Devo. But as soon as X was on, I was like, no, no, these, this is the thing for me. So I got into X and X was one of my favorite bands of that time. And then, then my friends played me uh, the germs record. So for me, the progression was from X to the germs and then black flag. And then between those three bands, I kind of was on my way to, to being a, to being a punker basically. And I would start to go to the shows out in Hollywood with my friends. And uh, that's about, that's probably right about when I joined the band. And so then I just, you know, then it's like, once you start, playing with all these other bands. I mean, we, the, all the, the, the descendants would always play with Black Flag, Minutemen, Saccharin Trust, you know, DOA, all these bands. And once that opens up, then you just, you're just, you're just kind of absorbing all this great music, all this, you know, kind of early eighties punk rock. And that's kind of, you know, that was what became my kind of obsessive compulsive thing as I got it. So, you know, for many years, though, that's all I would listen to was like L.A. punk rock, you know, not even like, you know, I guess I would listen to some non L.A. punk rock, but I was really well versed in L.A. punk rock. And that was my thing. So, yeah. So between the the new wave and the, like the germs and those guys, did you ever get to hang out with Dottie Danger? No. Wait, what band was he in or she? Wait, Dottie, you, was he in the was he in the germ? Wait, germs? Wait. Yeah, the, she went. She became well. I guess she always was Belinda Carlisle. Oh, 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 oh! Right. Okay. 
That was her name when she was in the germs. Yeah. yeah. I guess by the time I was listening to germs, she was gone. She, I mean, she was in the go-go's and I, yeah, we, I think everyone in our, everyone in my peer group there went through like the go-go's crush phase. So we would all go see the go-go's. <laughs> I'm still in that phase. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah still around too. Yeah. I mean, they, and they, yeah, they were, they were great. You know, and they, they, I think they started out pretty punk anyways, before they, mm-hmm you know, before they kind of got their pop chops going, but uh, they were, you know, they played the mask and they, they would, you know, they were doing the punk rock thing early on till they, till they got more poppy, but. Uh, Did they go by uh, the bangs first? No, that was the bangles that went by the bangs. Okay. okay. So, yeah. They were bangs. Also, we, we all had crushes on the bangs as well. <laughs> Still do. Still do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's that's awesome but uh as the merch marketing guy you know i've always would love to hear a story about how something becomes so iconic in, in our eyes you know we all know the milo imagery it's all it's become such this ingrained piece of culture i, mean, I know trevor's got a tattooed on him at some point i'll probably oh, yeah. yeah i got it somewhere so it'll, be added to my, it'll be added to my stack here at some point but uh What's the true story behind that? What was the band's original reaction to making that the the image of the Descendants? Yeah, so that was a that was originally drew, drawn by my uh, friend in high school, Roger, uh, and he would draw it kind of during class uh, as a way to as a way to kill time. You know, should have been listening to the teacher, but instead he's like doodling. He was. He was he would doodle and make these cartoons of, of things. And one day he hit upon this cartoon of, you know, the adventures of Milo or something. And he, he, he did it just as a way of kind of ribbing me. It's kind of like a, <laughs> this is, you know, this is I'm going to make fun of my friend. I mean, you know, when, who, who, yeah, yeah. Make fun of your friends. Who can you make fun of? So he, he made exactly. this, fun of me in this cartoon. And that was the original kind of face um, that he drew. Um, and he would. Uh, you know, do that to try to get, to try to get a laugh out of me. Um, and uh, then he, w- then, uh, then he went off to West Point And when we wanted to use it for our first album cover, um, Bill said, well, let's get Roger to draw it. I said, no, he's off, he's off at West Point. He can't do it. So we got our friend Jeff to draw it for the Milo Goes to College uh, album cover. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, Jeff drew it. And we kind of thought, oh, that was a fun thing to do. Now we, now we don't need to do that anymore. And, you know, we weren't even really planning on ma- making a second record, except that in 85 we did. So when we made a second record, you know, the, the SST, this guy, Joe Carducci at SST, had this bright idea of, hey, let's, let's bring back the Milo head. <laughs> you know? And we're like, what? <laughs> oh, really? That thing? Uh, he said, no, no. The album's called I Don't Want to Grow Up, so we'll have the Milo head on a baby. And there you go. There's your album cover. And so we thought, OK, yeah. So so then we brought it back and we tried. We kept trying to get away from it because we thought, well, yeah. that's not going to define us. We we want to, you know, we want to do other stuff besides that, have that head. But then it kind of kept creeping back into the story because, you know, whoever we were working with, they're like, no, we like that. We like that 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 face or whatever. So, you know, eventually we're stuck with it and that's where we are now. We're stuck with it. And, and I think, you know, I, I say that kind of like, Oh, boo hoo, we're stuck with it, but it's been a lot of fun over the years because we, we try to get artistic with it and do have them do different things, get creative. And, you know, it, may, it makes for, it, it makes for a little uh, more fun. And it, 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 it basically allows me to pretend that I can have some artistic kind of creative input into the band other than the music part so i try to get i try to brainstorm ideas for it and so does bill and we have our guy chris sherry doing the, the drawings and absolutely we all chris is so awesome yeah and yeah so we we put our heads together and try to come up with you know what's Mila gonna do now uh you know for every show for most shows that we do uh we 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 will we'll like market a shirt just for that show it'll be like a, an event specific shirt and that makes it fun for the kids to, to get a shirt like that. Uh, that's it's specific for an event, and it's fun for us because we get to you know come up with some ideas to do that. So it's it's been fun over the years. 
Definitely. I was going to say, after 40 years in punk rock, I'm surprised Milo didn't go to rehab. I mean, you know, so, so, <laughs> it does happen to some people. Like, hey. <laughs> <Or these. Yeah. laughs> well, speaking of beer and art, my personal art, I am a chef and I work at a gastro pub uh, where we brew our own beer and do our own stuff. But that I always had me wondering about the song Wiener Schnitzel. Was that just the song that was one of those goofy things that you just run, that you just wrote and had fun with and kind of caught on, or was there a real story behind it? I, I mean, I guess the main story, because Bill Bill did, Bill wrote it, and he was um, he was really into Wiener Schnitzel, <laughs> as you might expect, since he wrote the song. We we used to we used to go to practice out in Long Beach. We would drive there. And stop at Wiener Schnitzel on the way, and get our chili cheese dog. He and I, and pound that down, and then go off to band practice. Um, and it became such a a ritual, you know, that he that he thought. I I think he just felt such enthusiasm about it that he wanted to write this song about it. Um, and at the time, you know, we were. This was during the Fatty P. Fatty P being a really appropriate name for songs about food, I guess. But uh, he, we were all drinking a bunch of coffee and all the songs were like, gah, 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 gah. so then that's the way he wrote Wiener Schnitzel. Like, okay, I'm just going to beat on the drums and you're going to say these lines and that's the song. Gah, 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 gah. So that was, so he, yeah. And I think he decided that, uh, well, we'll have Tony pretend to be the, Tony, the bass player is going to pretend to be the, 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 the counter or not the counter guy, but the, the takeout guy, the, the drive, the drive through guy. And then uh, we'll just, we'll do that. And uh, yeah, so it, it, it all just kind of, I mean, I'm trying to think, did we even do that one live? I don't think we did it live before that point. Mm -hmm. I think we, he made a, he might've written it and then they worked it out in the studio and said, here's my new song. And then they just go one, two, three, four, go. And they did it. And yeah. So, I mean, we had a few other, I, I think after he wrote that one, Bill thought, oh, that worked out really well. I'm going to write another one. And then he wrote this other song called Volcano Burger, where he just went, I want to go to Volcano Burger. I want to go to Volcano Burger. I want to go to Volcano Burger. <laughs> and, uh, I, said, I said, Bill, it's not as good. Let's, you know. <laughs> we don't need another, you know, we don't need another fast food song. I think we're okay. With what you're saying is Bill, Bill is the guy, the, is the eater of the group, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's, well, I, I I gotta ask real quick if you're doing a lot of rehearsals in Long Beach, how far are you traveling? Because there are Wiener Schnitzels everywhere, obviously. But <laughs> yeah, we're. I mean, we were coming from the South Bay, South Bay down to Long Beach. It's it's about a 40, 35 minute trip, 35, 40 minute trip, straight down Peace Beach. I'm sitting in Huntington Beach right now, so I'm very familiar with the area. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the funny thing is, is that uh, you know, so over the years when we are in a town that has a wiener system where we make the pilgrimage to, <laughs> to there, like got to do it, you know? Um, and so when we played last time we played in the, the LA area, we actually were, we were playing, we were playing with the rise against in, in Irvine at the Irvine amphitheater out there. I had to, I had to ride my bike from my mom's house because my mom lives in the South Bay and I had to take a combination of uh, metros, some metros in LA and also, and also some uh, just on my bike, biking uh, along, uh, from Metro to Metro. And so I, the last Metro I took, then I had to bike all the way to the Irvine Amphitheater and I passed up a wiener so I said, hmm, <laughs> <laughs> I need to take advantage of this. So I got like, I got like, I don't know, 20 chili cheese dogs and, oh, and, and, I, I, put bag and I put it in my backpack and I, I show up at the, at the Irvine Amphitheater and I, Bring them back to the guys, and everyone's just like, "Whoa, <laughs> that's amazing!" <laughs> so, if, well, if Rito Stitchell's on the menu that much, then uh, that, does that explain the song "Enjoy"? And uh, how many times do you do you actually enjoy smelling farts? <laughs> and, yeah. and, you know, we don't kink shame, so you know. Well, you know, chili <laughs> chili cheese dogs are known to 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 produce that type of effect, and we, <laughs> <laughs> when we recorded "Enjoy." When we recorded that song, we had to kind of we had to kind of prep for it a little bit by going to the, to the Mexican food place 
that was a couple blocks from the club. Oh, the pregame show? <laughs> a couple blocks from the studio, sorry. So I brought back big old burritos and we pound, pounded down burritos and then created the, 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 the effect that we needed to kind of record and joy. Um, yeah, so we, I mean, uh, you know, I, I look back on that and I always feel like, at least for me, Farts never get old. It's just, it's never, farts will always be funny. I just, that's, and that probably go to my, I'll probably be like on my dying deathbed and I'll fart and I'll be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing is like, I can, we can change topics. We can, we can talk about this, that, but you throw a dick or fart joke in there. Right? You got my attention. It, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know what? I, I guess, I guess I haven't really, you know, for a while there I was, I was, I got to put a fart song on every record. And so I, <laughs> and I guess on like cool to be you, I was able to slip in blast off on there, which is uh, somewhat yep. related. So absolutely love that song. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, you know, I, I still kind of, I'll still kind of rip off or I'll still kind of rip out the, uh, the, the, the fart song occasionally. Um, but I've kind of taken over the, the helm as the farter in the band pretty much. Bill doesn't fart anymore because he, uh, he, uh, well, he lost his sense of smell. And so he doesn't, he doesn't like to fart because he doesn't know. He, he doesn't can't like enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to feel <laughs> inferior. He doesn't know anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So first of all, he doesn't fart himself anymore. And then he doesn't like it if I fart. I'm like, dude, come on. This is, this is part of our bond. We bonded over the past. Come on. He's Is like, he starting to fun. feel like phantom pains around his rectum? You know, because he can't I, smell him. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is he says, he says, look, you could, you, when you fart, now there's this colloidal turd in the air. And, <laughs> and I can't even smell it. I can't. <laughs> he says, because I, because I can't smell anymore because I lost my sense of smell. Then I don't know like what danger. I'm like, am I in danger now? I don't know. So that's <laughs> so he's off. He's off of it. He's he's done with it. It's it's, it's kind of sad. <laughs> that's excellent. Farts are such a part of the uh, fatherhood. You know, your kids. I think it's a great way we bond. And so we're all punk rock dads here. So how how do you think punk has shaped you as a parent? Um, I think, uh, I think punk has allowed me to kind of give my kids kind of more of a free reign. I mean, and that's maybe not just punk, but it's the fact that I was, I was kind of raised that way too. I mean, I was, my parents were pretty much hands off for me. There wasn't a lot of like cracking the whip on me. And I just, I took that plus my experience in punk and thought, I'm going to, my, I want my kids to kind of explore and I want them to do creative things and I want them to choose their own way th through the world. And I think that's what punk, punk has helped me to kind of, my, my experiences with punk have been that, you know, because I, because I w was kind of just allowed to have free reign like that. Uh, it, it, it worked out for me. It was very satisfying in a creative way. So I think I just want to give them that same thing is, is, is to have them. It's, it's basically, I trust them. Um, and, uh, I, I think, I think that's, that's the best way to parent is, is through, you know, you instill, you let them know that you trust them and, and, uh, and you, and you give them this, you know, you give them free reign and they're, they're going to fuck up and then, but they're going to know that they fucked up, you know, and they're going to, they're going to, they're, you know, and, and I think also they know that, that, that even though I'm giving them free reign, we, we have, as parents have also high expectations of them as well just as humans so yeah well, i but, think like our generation of parents you know they kind of forgot that they were kids once and they put so much hammer into us that they you know there was that whole uh you know kids should be seen and not heard right but in my house that's that's the other way around you know if i don't see you like i still hear you we're good <laughs> you know if <laughs> yeah, going exactly. on <laughs> yeah i mean if anything I've, I've i've talked to other parents of my age and and they keep they I've heard some of them say like, man, these kids need something to rebel against because they're too tame, you know, they're too they don't have enough to rebel against. But you know, uh, well, they, they'll find they've it. got they've got the things to rebel against. They're just not doing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's lots 
lots out there, right? Yeah. But. So, Marilyn, uh, between, you know, the band and then pursuing higher education, going on getting your doctorate, working in molecular biology, coming back into the band, and ebbing and flowing out of this, um, like all parents, you know, there's sacrifices that we have to make along the way. What were some of the significant ones that you had to make to, you know, keep food on the table and to keep moving forward in really multiple career streams? Well, I, I, I think, I think uh, I didn't want to be the kind of, I didn't want to be that like absentee dad where I kind of go, uh, I'll see you in three months. I'm going to go off on tour, you know, and I did that before I had kids. But then once I had kids, I, for one thing, I was also be, having another career at the same time. So between having my other career and having kids, it definitely, the sacrifices were just, you know, we kind of, we kind of shelved the band there for many, for many years. Uh, and that did coincide somewhat with having kids. And it, for me, it also coincided with me, having a different career. Um, but I think that's probably one of the things that, you know, as, as a dad, it's, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I feel like, I feel like my wife and my kids are more important to me than, than punk rock. <laughs> I think that's, that's, I can, I can say yeah. that without any, without any reservation. And so if it meant that I wasn't going to tour so that I could be with them, I'd, I'll do that. You know, now my kids are, you know, basically almost out of the house. And so now's my chance to rock. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that's a, a big sacrifice that, that I, I was happy to make was to not, was to, to kind of put aside the music so I could be a dad. And so I could be, try to try to be a scientist for a while, at least, you know? Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's I think, uh, you know, keeping everything in perspective. I don't, I, I always felt like I was good at that. In fact, to a fault, I was probably really good at keeping music in perspective because I was always willing just to kind of walk away from it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think, you know, and part of that is just, I never considered it a career. Um, and because I could, because I never considered it a career, I could always just go, you know what, I'm just going to leave this behind. You know, I always thought I was leaving it behind, but really I was just kind of putting it on the shelf for a while and then pulling it back off the shelf later. So. Well, in speaking of uh, being on tour, Milo, um, what what country outside of the United States would you say you had the most fun in, and which country would you say it was like? Eh, I don't know. And why was it Canada? <laughs> <laughs> Do I was getting something? <laughs> well, Canada has always been great. I, I mean, actually, I love Canada, even just with my family. My, my family's been to Toronto. We've been to yep. Montreal. We've been to Vancouver. We've even been to Canmore and, and, and uh, Edmonton. So nice. they, uh, a lot of the times when my when the band plays up there, my, my immediate thing I do is I turn to my family and go, hey, Canada, what do you say? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic trips in Canada. So maybe that would be it. That would be that would probably be my best. Because I, I think it's in, in terms of the fact that with Canada has been where the band has played, where I was, I was able to bring my family so much. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been Canada. And so, uh, you know, my daughter, I think even the, after the first time she went up to Canada, said, I want to move here. She wants to move up to someplace up there eventually. I mean, we all loved Vancouver quite a bit. Um, but, but she also oh, loved uh y'all as well vancouver yeah. montreal you know those kind of places but yeah yeah Van vancouver bc alberta uh those places are beautiful yeah. i've only like gone out west once and like, where, are you at, where are you at now where do you live in canada i i'm southern ontario so i'm okay. two hours from toronto okay and uh like london know what yeah london? yeah about, about an hour from london i'm I'm in between the two. I'm in between the two. Uh, Stratford, Ontario. Uh, Justin Bieber is from uh, here. 
<laughs> I, I don't know where there's to stand. Sorry, there, congratulations. Right, right. There's our claim to fame. <laughs> no, we 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 have the Stratford um, uh, Shakespeare Festival, uh, which is oh yes, theater. world famous. I, you know. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so we have that, but we don't get much for punk rock shows unless my band's playing at the bar or something like that. Well, I don't um, think we have played there. We pl we've played London, but we never played Stratford, I don't think. Yeah, yeah, no, pro probably not. Probably not. There's not really, <laughs> aside, aside from the Masonic Hall, there's not a venue that could really do a Descendants show like Justice. But London, London, I've, I mean, I grew up, I grew up a uh, half hour from London. So, all my punk rock, like growing up, was London, Ontario, and uh, yeah, yeah. You guys come back to London. I'm there, like in oh, freaking yeah. heartbeat. You come back to Toronto next time. I'm there in a heartbeat. Like, yeah. come we on. need to do a, <laughs> we need to do a whole a whole Canada cross across Canada. We pop up from the states now and again, but I'd love to just go right across and do it all. Not in the winter. That would though. be awesome. No, 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 no. Today is crappy. I went out for groceries and I'm like sliding all over the place with an all wheel drive. I'm like, yeah, welcome to Canada. <laughs> so I, in the line of continuing the tour questions, uh, yeah. you know, I, I have to share my, my favorite descendants moment was in the 90s my wife and i before we had kids did a show um i think it was the orange show pavilion out there in uh, san Bernardino county and it was such a horrid show the way the promoters put it on it was straight edge bands and punk bands and ska bands and there were stretchers going in and out of the pit constantly and um at some point the cops came and, and shut the power off and you said, fuck it, we're still playing. And, and you guys kept playing even with the power off. And then eventually we got gassed out of the building. And, and so for me, it was such an iconic like moment because everything else was just your vanilla punk show, vanilla punk show for Southern California. This one was like chaos. What would you say is, is one of your favorite or most iconic memories of, of venues or shows that you played um, in the life of the Descendants? Well, there's a lot to choose from, <laughs> but I probably would choose um, this show in the, so Bill got really sick in 2010, 2010, and he uh, they had to remove a brain tumor from his head. Um, he, he had had a pulmonary embolism first, then later on realized, they realized, oh, the reason why you had that pulmonary embolism is because you have the a tumor the size of a grapefruit in your head. So they had to remove that. So basically at that point, and he survived, obviously he's still here. And I, at that point, everyone in the band, we were, we had, we hadn't played a show in my God, probably eight years at that point. And uh, I was trying to pursue my science career. Um, so, but once, once Bill got, once Bill recovered, I, I thought, we should re we should uh, do do some shows um, because I just I got caught up in the whole euphoria of like yay Bill's still alive basically so yay let's go let's go Absolutely. do some shows the very first show Devo canceled at this festival in uh, Texas in Austin called uh, Fun 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 Festival uh, so they they offered it to us and say hey Devo headline is supposed to headline this show can you headline in place of Devo. And we said, yeah, we'll do it. Oh. And I think the thing about that show that was just so amazing is because we hadn't played in so long. We didn't know, you know, what was going to happen. Like, do, could, could we still do it? A, B, what are people going to think about this band that hasn't been around for eight years? And, you know, basically we get up there and, you know, we hit that first chord and, and everyone's just going nuts in the audience. I look back at Bill, I'm like, what the fuck? I can't believe this. You know, it's just a really, just an amazing experience because we didn't, we didn't know we could still do it, you know? And so, and basically since that show, we've just kind of, you know, kind of kept the pedal on the metal, so to speak. I mean, we haven't, we haven't had any other hiatuses and we're, we're famous for having the hiatus where we go, Hey, <laughs> we'll see you guys. And, you know, you're never, or for not for the next, you know, eight years, 
But ever since that show, it's been like, no, this is what we're going to do from here on out. So it, it, that, that's, that's why probably it was so imp important for us is that, is that it kickstarted this idea like, oh, wow, this, this, is, this is where we belong. This is, this is what I was meant to do, I guess. So, yeah. So how Absolutely. exciting is it for you to get to play the uh, Tony Hawk weekend with Devo on the bill? That's great. You know, it's Devo is one of those bands where, and X is another one of those bands, Devo and X, where yeah. when I, whenever I share the bill with them, I, I kind of go, ah, I got to go say hi, but I can't, you know, like you get that, like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't do it. You know? And like with X, I finally have gotten up the gumption to kind of corner John Doe and say, you know, I'm not worthy and do the whole, you know, <laughs> change my life or whatever. And he's just looking at me like, uh, you're making me uncomfortable here, dude. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not going to blame him, you know. But I, I, so I've seen Devo numerous times, but and each time now that I'm now that I can see them, I can be backstage. It's like, dude, just go up and talk to Mark Mothersbaugh. Just do it. Come on. So maybe I'll do that this time. I don't know. I just have never met him. And I just, you know, I'd love to kind of go, dude, you know, you changed my life. So no biggie. Yeah. You should. <laughs> you should. Yeah. Well, it's a week after my birthday, and I'm hoping to book myself some room in Vegas to be out there for that. Because, like you're talking about the guys the, you're going to get to be backstage with, man, just to be even in the crowd of that show for me, it, it's going to be a mind blowing experience. Yeah, I think my family might come, so that'll be really cool. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Silence. He's yeah, good. there you go. <laughs> Reverend Silence. Look, there you go. Look at me. <laughs> Being all proactive. And, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> that's okay. I, I, I'm also editing. So, <laughs> I, yeah. Um, so, Milo. <laughs> okay. And so, <Actually>. Milo. <laughs> <laughs> That's a band. <laughs> okay. All right. We're good. So Milo, as a band, um, writing songs, uh, do you guys have like a, a certain procedure the way you guys do things or, uh, you know, does, you know, do you come up with lyrics first and be like, hey, man, I, I got this cool idea for a song and or, or do you sit down with the guitar and, and write some lyrics and be like, hey, what do you guys think of this? Or do the other guys kind of throw the songs at you and like, hey, write something to this? <laughs> well, I mean, I think part, you know, the dynamic that we started out with really from the get-go with me when I joined is that, and I mentioned this before, they already had a whole set list of right. songs that I had no involvement in. So I became very proficient at singing their words. And so we have a, we have a fair amount of songs now where, where people bring in, Carl will bring in a completed song and I'll be like, cool, show me the lyrics. I'll sing it. Bill, nice. same. Now, when I joined after, after a few months, Tony took me aside and said, dude, you should write a song. I go, I don't know how to write a song. Uh, he said, uh, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll write some music and you can write some words over and I'm sure you can do that. I said, okay, cool. Okay. I'll try that. You know? So he brought in some music and I wrote words over it, and that was eunuch boy. <laughs> <laughs> eunuch boy was like the first song I ever wrote for that. So that's one way that songs get written is that someone brings in a music and I'll write some words over it or, you know, or Bill will write words, words over it. So we have a lot of songs where uh, people bring in the music and then other people write words over it. And that's especially true right. for Stefan because Stefan doesn't write words. He only writes music. So he'll bring in a whole bunch of music and I'll, I'll write words over it, that kind of thing. Um, nice. And then, uh, so I guess because of the way that, because of the way that Tony brought in that first song and I wrote Eunuch Boy over it, I thought, well, maybe that's how songs are written. So maybe that's what I'll do. Right. So I wrote, I wrote, and a piece of music without words. And I showed it to Bill. Hey, check out this thing. I need to write some words for it. 
And he goes, oh, that sounds so hopeful. It's like the song that inspires hope. And I thought, huh, okay, well, that must be what I should write the song about. It's gotta be something hopeful, something about hope. And that was hope. And I wrote words yeah. fit over that music. So <laughs> my point in all this is that a lot of times, you know, it's music first, then words, but then I'll, I'll spend right. all, you know, more, I, more often than not these days, I'll write some words down and work a melody around those words and then flesh out chords underneath it so it can go either way you can you can you can come at it from either way words first or music and i i find each way each way is kind of fulfilling in a certain way because because you're you're just taking whatever you're doing it by hook or by crook you're finishing the song either right. you know starting with words or starting with music i mean bill's written songs where he says it all just happens at the same time like mm -hmm. it all just kind of came preformed in his head <laughs> yet, you know i've had a few experiences with like that, that but he's he's much more good about that where he's just like yeah i just woke up i had this i kind of had this dream and woke up and the song was kind of there and i just kind of did it that way so it's kind of one of those mad <laughs> did you ever have one of those writing did you ever have one of those moments uh like in practice or something where you just had an organic moment where somebody started playing something and then just kind of grew into a song that you actually recorded yeah 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 we've done that i mean probably that would have been more earlier on because we don't even live in the same town anymore so we're not that's one thing about what we do now is it, it's all it's all uh kind of geographically we're, we're separate so more often than not uh it's like stefan will say hey i got these i got this song i wrote that doesn't have words and i'll add words to it so it's not as organic as 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 that was what you're talking about. That those are those are some good memories of being back in the in the practice room together, where they're just kind of jamming out on a riff, and then we just write a song about it. And that occasionally that will happen too. It just hasn't happened recently because we don't really write songs like that anymore, or we can't because of the geographic issue. So yeah. Mm. Was there any song that 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 you guys wouldn't play? Like, uh, yeah, like anything that wouldn't, that would make it on a, like, say there's a song that you, maybe you didn't like singing, but it was uh, somebody else's song that, you know, and, but it made it on the list anyway, but maybe it wasn't your favorite song to, to perform. I think we pretty much all have veto power at this point. And so if, if any, if any one person were to say, yeah, I don't want to do that one, then it's gone. We're, we're not forcing anyone, in the, no one's forcing anyone else in the band to play a song they don't want to play. So anything that's on there we're all like yeah that's the we're doing these are the ones we we all like them and we're all we're gonna do give it our all so but we have had certain times where people say uh yeah i don't want to do that one anymore i i took out loser not that you know several years ago i guess um i think it was after the uh nightclub thing down in florida i was just like okay final straw can't do it anymore uh, and so took out loser, but right about the same time, Stefan says, you know what? I don't want to do, I'm not a, per I'm a, I'm a pervert anymore. That's, mm. And that was my song. I said, Hey, what's the matter with being, you know, what's the matter with being horny and wanting sex? That's, that's what the song's about. He, but he, he thought it was creepy. And I thought, right. oh, well, you know, I, I, that, that's a fault of me for make, for not writing it in a way that got across the fact that I'm horny, but I'm not a creep about it. <laughs> Well, see, that's kind of the beauty of language and even la especially language in punk rock. You can kind of blur the line where you're being sarcastic and everything else. Yeah. But when you're talking about what like like loser that we're getting into, like, you know, parts of speech now, you know, the the, the deletion of the song or, or, or the attempt of the word. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I, I think the problem there is that I spent many years. This would been probably been in the 80s and 90s, probably more than the 90s where it was like, okay, I'm going to sing something. I'm just going to sing something else at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be something, you know, that, that's, that's not, that's not so kind of punching down. I don't want to punch down on people so much. We didn't view it as punching down when we wrote it, because when it, when it was written, it was just more like this, like, you know, fuck, you know, like more, it was almost punching up when we were, when we were, when we wrote it, because it was just more like, okay, it was written about like these jocks in our high school, Mm -hmm. And so what's a good way to kind of, you know, get their goat and maybe to, maybe to use this word. And now it's, but, you know, in retrospect, it's kind of like, well, that, that was of that time and it's not of the, of the time now. And it hasn't been of this time for many, many years now. So I was changing the words and saying something else, 
But then I realized that people in the audience are singing back at me off the, how, it's, how it is on the record. And so I just said, we're not gonna, we won't do it anymore. We won't do that one. So it's, it's gone. And that's, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think, I, my, like I said, I don't wanna, I wanna, we're a punk rock band. We wanna be able to kind of have our fists out and punch up at people, but I don't wanna punch down on anybody. That's kind of- yeah. what it is. I like that perspective a lot. Good roll of the pit. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the song, I like food, like every, like most everybody else, especially as a, as youngsters, like in burgers and fries and turkey legs, we've also gotten a bit older and a little more concerned about our health. So how has your personal diet changed since those days, since the Wiener schnitzel days and all that? <laughs> well, I I allow myself to cheat occasionally with a with a, with a little wiener schnitzel, but I I'm it's not it's definitely not a staple of my diet. <laughs> I wouldn't be here talking to you. I'm sorry, I'd be in the grave at this point if, if that were the case. But not we. Uh, I mean, you know, like for example, even Bill. Like we're talking about Bill's being the kind of the foodie of the band and and the one who wrote wiener schnitzel. He's now a vegan. So we've all we've all you know realized that you know you have mortality staring in your face and. I've been to the doctor and they've, they've, they've looked at my cholesterol. And, and so I kind of, so I kind of go, Oh fuck, I better, uh, you know, go the straight and narrow. Um, uh, and so I did write a song on uh, the last record, Hypercafium, That was basically about, I call it an update of, I like food. It's like, it's like, I like food circa 2016, where <laughs> it's kind of like, uh, yeah, I can't have that stuff anymore. Uh, you know, one of the lines is doctor took my lipid profile. He told me I'm barely live, you know, so I just. <laughs> <laughs> no more great surprise. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, my, my grandpa did die at 45 and my dad did have three open heart bypasses. So it's him, you know, I, I have a family history. And so that was why I was relaying that song. And I just kind of, you know, I having having written it though. You know, you you kind of write something like that, and then and then you're like, are you when now? Am I gonna am I gonna become a monk or what? Am I gonna am I gonna become like a macrobiotic guy? No, I I just try to I try to you know limit my limit my indulgences uh, to to you know to very few. Like I used to I used to be all about the ice cream, and now I just have ice cream like very 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 occasionally. You know, and trade in the ice cream for the kefir. You know. What's that? Right on the ice cream for the kefir. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> kefir. Yeah, exactly. Bill, no, I mean, my daughter's a my daughter's a vegetarian, and, and she's kind of like helped us kind of steer steer our diets more towards. I call it flexitarian. I mean, I mm -hmm. probably yeah. have vegetarian food four or five nights a week, and then you know, I'll, I'll break I'll break out the meat, <laughs> a little bit of meat, a little bit yeah. of meat. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> So Milo, I'm I'm also a scientist, but uh, haven't not quite as uh, in depth with the squishy stuff as you. But as you did your research in molecular biology, did you have any interest or experience with molecular gastronomy? Speaking you're of food, yeah, you're physics. Yeah, I'm a physicist. That's great because my dad was a physicist. I, I, yeah, yeah, he he studied solid, awesome. solid. He was in solid state physics. Okay. Yeah, so. early semiconductor stuff. My daughter is actually working on some kind of material science right now. As an undergrad, she did a worked on graphene and the, Very the, cool. the effects of, uh, uh, I guess, deformation on uh, graphene and to generate the mono vacancies and all that that might mm -hmm. affect uh, electrical conductivity and all that. So it's great to see her doing that because that's what my dad kind of did similar stuff with like gallium, arsenide, all that kind of those kind of things. So, anyways, yeah. Thumbs up to the, to the physics. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. Um, so the question was, uh, having done research in molecular biology, did you have any interest or have you had any experience with molecular gastronomy? Uh, molecular gastronomy. Not, not, not per se, but I think we, uh, 
I, I've always been interested in uh, in how our favorite drug of choice in the band, which is co coffee, caffeine. Caf caffeine is something where if you were to say to the band, hey, like we've had people say, hey, make a recipe for our punk rock cookbook. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to have to do coffee. So we've made like, like the recipe for a bonus cup, you know, so that coffee is always our go-to in terms of something where we can say we're gourmet about it. Like, and we are pretty much snooty about our coffee. Nice. Um, but uh, in terms of the molecular part of that, I do, I do, I do kind of get, you know, kind of, I do get kind of uh, geek. I do geek out a little bit about uh, the effects of caffeine on, uh, on the body because uh, the, it's, it's why I drink it, you know? Um, and so I, I, we wrote a song for the new record, uh, uh, that's called, uh, oh no, no, I'm going to forget the name of the song. Anyways, I, I, I saw this, this pot, this woman who did this, uh, series of podcasts where she does your, this is your brain on X. This is your brain on caffeine. This is your brain on alcohol. And I watched the one on caffeine and it was so inspiring to me that I just wrote a song based upon literally based upon her podcast about this is your brain on caffeine and you know she goes through the the uh the effects of caffeine on the the adenosine receptors and the fact mm -hmm. that when you when it binds to the adenosine receptor it it blocks it, it then effectively blocks the adenosine binding there which is what contributes to people feeling uh, kind of uh sleepy because as soon as this adenosine binds the adenosine receptor that's when you feel sleepy so that's what caffeine is doing it's making you feel less sleepy by blocking adenosine's action basically. So that that's as far as I go in terms of molecular, the molecular effects on, on things that you might take in. So, yeah. yeah. So, so in essence, I have to ask and, and, and jutting in with a question, um, edgy topical subject, because whether they're punk rock or not is, is up for debate in a lot of circles, but uh, have you done the Oakland coffee from Green Day? They have an Oakland coffee? Green Day's got their own coffee company in Oakland now. Oh, I'll have to check that out. We we had we made our own coffee beans uh, uh, through uh, this place in Fort Collins because uh, Bill lives in Fort Collins. He contacted right. this woman Jackie at Jackie's Java. They made us a coffee that we called the Bonus Blend, and it <laughs> it was just oh, it was just just the best. It's like mm, it was the best coffee mm -hmm. ever. Uh, you know, kind of a French oily roast. And uh, we package it in a nice kind of, you know, descendant style bag with the face on there and all that. And, uh, and uh, I still order that now. I mean, it doesn't come in the fancy bag, but I get, I get Jackie to order and I get it in like 10 pound amounts and just, it's my favorite coffee ever. So uh, yeah, but no, it's, it's, we, um, we definitely are are open to you know people working with people on this kind of stuff. Like we we're working with a company. Uh, we're going to be making probably another uh, a coffee coffee beer. Like we did a coffee beer a few years ago uh, with McKellar, which was a coffee IPA, and uh, and that's something where you know we 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 wanted to, we want it had to be a coffee a coffee beer, and we'll probably do another coffee beer. So. Yeah, I mean, we're we're, we're all about uh, we're all about like marketing coffee whenever we can. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> My wife is real big into health and nutrition stuff, and she got off of coffee for God, about three years because she had read reports about oh, uh, <clears throat> I guess the majority of beans that are stored are stored for so long that they actually start growing mycotoxins. Oh shit! Okay, and. I don't know. Just as you're talking about that, I think I'm just picturing this idea for yet another Descendants T-shirt. Instead of having mycotoxins, you have like little caffeine mm -hmm. molecules that have little toxins. Toxins is what crossed my mind. <laughs> Punchline. <laughs> wow, I didn't know about the mycotoxins. I'm not surprised. Yeah. But you got to. Well, I mean, so now she's very much about you know getting. What that means is don't let your coffee sit around. Better. Back yeah, well, exactly. Oh. Just drink it faster, <laughs> <laughs> and more of it. <laughs> That's what I do. I, I was actually I tried to grow a coffee plant. Uh, it, I, I'm right at the line where I could almost do it. No, we're not quite. I'm not quite tropical. We're, we're subtropical, but not quite tropical enough to where it'll take well. So I tried. 
was like, I buy own coffee plant didn't work. That's pretty ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> In Florida, <laughs> we can do that because we either we either gonna we either gonna give a, a, a we're gonna give Reese's Macaques herpes or we're gonna grow a coffee tree. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Oh geez! And the herpes, so, the herpes monkeys thing is not is not. It's actually real. There, there's a there's a literally a, a a whole troop of these monkeys running around in Ocala that have some herpes that is highly infectious to all of us. So yeah. Stay away geez. from that. So Florida strikes again. Yeah, Florida man strikes again. <laughs> Florida man is a monkey. So, so speaking of like plants and. And this and that. What the heck is thale cress or a ripid? Uh, Rabidopsis. A Rabidopsis. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. trying to remember. We're still stumbling over that one. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey <laughs> I'm not a scientist, man. <laughs> yeah, well, I used to, before Rabidopsis, I did work on something a little more, uh, uh, I'd say, no, uh, uh, something a little more uh, recognizable, and that was maize. Right. I worked on I worked on maize corn as a grad student, um, and part of the thing I was trying to do there was 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 uh, work on the the seed corn seed and trying to make it more am- balanced in amino acids. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was there was this notion of like, hey, if we're going to feed the world, wouldn't it be better to feed the world with with a corn seed that's it's got the amino acids that are uh, that are essential for humans to to have, um, and so that was that was the kind of long term goal of working in maize. But then when I, I when I switched and got in uh, started my postdoc, I work I started working with Arabidopsis. Now Arabidopsis is is a small weed. It's not good for anything. It's it's, it's not something you can market. It's not something that people want to eat or anything. <laughs> but it's something that. That is, it's something that has good genetics. Basically, it's the genetics are it has genetics that are that are very amenable to um, to research. Uh, small genome, all the genes are known, and so that was the reason why uh, uh, people started working with Arabidopsis. Um, and the idea is that you you can find a gene, maybe you can find a gene in Arabidopsis that helps the plant grow better, and then you can take that gene. And use and find the find the analogous gene in say in say corn, and get and 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 you you kind of use Arabidopsis to shoehorn your way back into a, an actual crop plant that's important to people, um, and that was the idea behind that. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it was it, it was a good time. It was a good time. I mean, I think uh, in retrospect. In retrospect, it probably would have been better just to stick with corn, really, because uh, <laughs> that's 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 the thing that everyone you know eats or whatever. So yeah, yeah. There's a, there's that's like uh, it's it's one of the grass family, isn't it? Right. Well, corn is, yeah. Yeah. Corn's in the grass family, yeah. Uh, the well, Rabidopsis. Where does that come from? That's that's part of the Brassica family, which means it's really closely related to canola and okay. broccoli. Broccoli, canola, cabbage. Those are all brassicas. So in fact, if you study Arabidopsis, the, the easiest thing to make, a, to make a parallel with or to say, hey, I found a gene in Arabidopsis would probably be canola. Okay. And that's, that's, you know, up, up you few folks up in Canada, canola yeah. is a big thing up there. So, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We have canola oil all over. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I think, I think uh, we never, because we, the, the company we we're in, it was very, it was very corn focused. So everything had to work back to corn, but I kept saying, you know what? I bet you we'd have more success if we if we used Arabidopsis as a springboard to get to get to make some advances in canola. Right. I'll start with two plus two rather than jumping right into quadratic functions. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Oh well, well, well. So, which nucleic acid or protein is the biggest poser? Uh. Uh. Well, I think I said this before, but uh, I think it's, I called the human genome <laughs> itself. Human, the human genome itself is the biggest poser because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's full of junk DNA. It's really huge. Like the human genome is, you know, however many thousands of megabases, 
but then it's just got your standard complement of genes that, that, a, that a eukaryote would have. Um, so what's, why does it have all that DNA in between? What's, what's all that DNA doing in between? It's not coding for anything. And I think it's just that, uh, you know, the human genome has got a big ego and it's like, I'm bigger, <laughs> I'm bigger than everyone else. And the dirty little secret is, is it's, it's all junk. Yeah. Oh, all that extra stuff just makes us chubby <laughs> as we get older. So basically, it's the, it's the teenage the boy stuff in a stock in the underwear, right? This is exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's the cucumber. It's the cucumber in the jeans. <laughs> Well, you know, it, speaking of transitions, I'll transition out of the science for a second because science and my brain don't work very well together. Um, I, I am not my son. I'm more like my daughter, who's a liberal arts person. That's me. But uh, uh, what have the transitions between, and I know you touched a little bit earlier on not seeing the band as a career, but obviously there's a business side to it. Um, what have the transitions between the band and a career in science or whatever uh, and the band as the business or the career. How's that look for you personally over the last few decades? I mean, is that, what, where did you find the balance in that? Well, I, I, early on when I was doing this, there were a couple things that, there were a couple things that really made me think hard about like, do I really wanna be doing this as a career, music? And one of the obvious was, is that, one of the obvious ones was that you, you couldn't really make a living at it. You know, you could say, I want to be, have a career as a musician, but if you're, if you're playing punk rock in 1982, it's like, yeah, right. So no, it was, it was, it, there's no, it's, it's a, it was laughable to think, Oh, I'm going to have a career in music at that point. Um, no, it had to be a hobby. Um, and the, and then, and the other, the other side of it was also just that, um, that is that my um my kind of my psychological makeup is such that it that it wasn't even something that i was really that fit me very well as a, as a as a as a person the kind of like the sex drugs and rock and roll you know i didn't want to do drugs and and i didn't really have a lot of success with the, with the other part of it <laughs> so the rock and roll was <laughs> you know so uh so that was, I think at that point, it was like, well, I'm not, this, this really isn't something that I can have as a career. And I'm not, the lifestyle is kind of like, I'm not really embracing the lifestyle. It's not something that's, that I'm really just like, yay about. So that, that, that kind of led me to, to kind of go, well, I got this other interest in, in, in science and I'm just going to pursue that. Um, and, um, that seemed, that seemed to be kind of, to me at that point, it was the natural, it was just the natural thing to do. I'm going to go do that. And Bill was completely like, yeah, I mean, that makes sense. That makes sense to me, you know, that you, you have this kind of drive to be a scientist, go do it. And so that kind of this whole dance that I had of in being in the band, not being in the band, back and forth, back and forth. Bill the whole time was like, yeah, you know, I, I can see where you would want to be in science or whatever. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, at some point, it became clear that I couldn't just uh, walk away from it. I couldn't just, every, every time I try to walk away, it, it would kind of draw me back. It draws you back in. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, got, I, I would get drawn back in. And I think uh, at some point, we both, Bill and I both kind of labeled it as that I have a, the need to rock. It was like, it, it was this like, underlying need to rock. And that's why I couldn't leave it behind. And that pretty much is what it came down to be is that even though I don't like the lifestyle, I do like to rock out. And so that's why I got, I keep getting back into it. And, and so the good news is that unlike in 1982, now I can, I can satisfy my need to rock and make a living doing it. So that's, that's been, it's been one of the most, uh, gratifying things of of my 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 later years is that you mean i get to do this and 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 it, 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 it it's still fun and i can make a living at it so it, it's all good and uh you know it, it's i i'm still very just grateful the way it all worked out uh you know the fact the fact that people still want to come see us play 
and uh, and we're we're still healthy enough to do it, and we can still make some music together. And I'm still friends with those guys. I mean, it's just such a series of you know just blessings that we have. So I've been enjoying it. I like to hear that because I mean there is geographic distance between like you and Carl and Stefan and Bill. So just you know the no I guess the notion of you know like I get to rock out and do this like like who cares if there's distance man we get to get together and and you know we get to do descendant songs and you know rock people's faces off on a on a nightly basis or that's that's kind of what it works out to be like when we all when we all fly in and we all fly into a city to start maybe we're going to start like a 10-day tour because we don't really do the three month tours anymore. We're doing like, you know, 10 days and we're going to go, but you fly in, you get off the, you, you get out of the airport and you go to the bus and it's just this great reunion. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like you haven't seen each other in so long. And it's just like, we're just back. We're back in that kind of like euphoric moment of, of being back together. It's, it's really quite a special thing because there's no, it's just so, uncanny how there's just no uh there's just there hasn't been any kind of like drama of the band of like you know friction like personality frictions we just know each other like we're we're married or whatever which is you know i guess it's good for a band to to have that to have that uh kind of acceptance of each other and that's what we've had though throughout the years is we've just always accepted each each other uh, totally and uh and also just rooted for each other as well. And, 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 uh, and wanted the best for each other. And then when we get together, it's just one big party, you know, we're just like, you know, just we're back, back being friends again. Yeah. I would argue you guys probably have one of the healthiest relationships of a band, like ever, you know, like with the hiatus and stuff. And or marriages uh, ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and part, but you know, part of that also is that, you know, we, we, none of this was planned in terms of like, oh, I'm going to leave the band and then come back, you know, this kind of like leave the band, then come back and leave. None of that was planned. It's just that it may have helped us to kind of weather what a lot of bands go through is just burnout, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and when we, when I would burn out, I would just go back to my science gig and they, and they'd be like, okay, we're going to go do all. And they would go do, go do all. And, but whenever that would happen, there was never any ill will. There was never any rancor. And so what it meant is when I came, when I would come back and say, Hey, let's make another record. I think it was kind of like, yeah, okay. We, we, we treated each other as just kind of not as enemies at that point, but just as like, you know, long lost friends that were just going to reunite again. And uh, it just seemed to, it, you know, it, uh, they're just great people, all three of them. And, and uh, I, I just, I also just feel like they've bent over backwards to kind of, to kind of facilitate my wild, you know, kind of like I'm the, I'm the ultimate prodigal son in some sense, because I just always go off and do my own thing and fuck them. And I'm going to do my own thing. And then they just welcome me back. And I, you know, I, I just, you know, they've been, they've been extremely patient with me <laughs> and, and also just, I mean, they've, they've just been, they've been the ones that uh, have just kind of persisted and they're the survivors. I'm not a survivor. They're, they, they're the ones that kind of had to deal with the, the, the lean years. And I just kind of, you know, came back when it was convenient. So I, it, I, it, I, I feel bad about on some level, just being that guy who just, you know, kind of came back and just kind of, okay, I'm back, let's do this. But uh, they're great. Yeah. So it, I'm going to deviate from my question that I had originally, but because it could be kind of touched on it or you did, you touched on it already, but the, uh, when it comes to the, the way the, the band operates, uh, what I've noticed when, when a band was successful for decades, the band knew to stay in their lane. Everybody knew their, their, their job, so to speak. And everybody just kind of, we, we, you come in, you do your job and you go home. And, and it sounds, that's very simplistic. But is that kind of how that works for you? Like everybody just knows their job. You go in, you do it. Yeah. And I think part of it also is part of knowing your job is that there's just no ego. There's no egos involved because, because you can, you can do your job really well. But if you're, if you're, if you're injecting all this kind of like negative toxic stuff in there vis-a-vis -vis your ego, mm. that's, that's not going to, 
go down. So you, yeah, you do your job, but also just, you know, you sub, you kind of sublimate, you sub, sublimate your kind of like uh, your infantile wishes and desires uh, to, to the point where they're not, you know, they're not going to interfere with the project. They're not going to interfere with the energy, the energy that's going on. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, we're very professional. <laughs> yeah. And we're very punctual too. We're very punctual. Punk. Jewel. <laughs> There's that dad joke we were waiting for. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Always. I will always have the dad joke. <laughs> Put the punk in punctual. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because like, you know, I, I tend to be a bit of a loose cannon. Uh, but if you were to look in my closet, all my shirts are hung. So there's that part of your, is that, you know, I can be chaos, but I like chaos with structure. <laughs> yeah. Well, Milo, you know, you've talked a lot about food and how much the band as a whole enjoys food, enjoys coffee. What would it take for me to get you and your family or you and the band to my gastro pub and off the beat? off the beaten path just to say thanks for decades of awesomeness and being good people where are we talking southwest virginia we're about two and a half hours north of charlotte north carolina okay right in the middle of the blue ridge mountains yeah well i think we're going to be somewhere in that area next year and we'll i'll try to make a stop by i'd, I'd love to check out your gastropub because uh i I like the pub part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we all like the pub part of it. Yeah, I, I like food and I food? like beer. Oh, I yeah. will be there. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, I think uh, we, I don't, you know, we're probably not playing in that town, but we're probably playing somewhere near there. And then we'll, we can try, I can try to make it, make it up there. Cause I, I'm always up for uh, some good food. Yeah. Do you do spicy food? Like really hot spicy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, any like any of that kind of like, you know, Thai, Indian, Mexican, I'm all for that. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Nice. So this is the one I'm going to entice you with. We we do a, we have a, a local guy who makes ten inch German bratwurst, and my baker makes uh, hot dog buns. It takes two buns to hold this thing. A bit. <laughs> <laughs> We top it with sautéed onions. The onions are sautéed with a mixture of um, habanero, ghost peppers, Ooh. lemon drop peppers, <laughs> four beans. Okay, we put a couple pickle slices in it. I have a whiskey glaze that we make. I make a ketchup out of tangerine and mango. We call it the whiskey tango fox fry. Uh, so it's that old uh, WTF. It's the whole <laughs> one. Yeah, I want, people, I want you when you see this thing, it's going to be so massive. You're going to go, what the fuck did I order? And then you're going to see all the massive shit on top. What the fuck? And then you're going to bite it and your mouth's going to be on fire. What the fuck did this guy do to me? Yeah. <laughs> There's your Come and get it. So and, you can tell, it. and you can tell Bill, you know, Chef here has promised me that he's going to work on a smoked tofu recipe because I'm the vegan in the group. And, okay. you know, chef, chef has to cater to the vegans as well. So let Bill know he'll have something special for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bill, we actually, Bill and I, uh, when, one time we played uh, Las Vegas and the, this uh, the show uh, uh, filmed us uh, eating a ghost ghost pepper burger um mm. so i can't remember the name of the of the restaurant but they invited us to to to, to eat this ghost pepper burger and uh and i remember I, I landed i landed at the vegas airport bill calls me and says hey they want us to, they want to they want us to eat these ghost pepper burgers and they're going to film us for this show i said okay no problem you know without even really you know thinking about it and <laughs> So we're eating these burgers and I mean, we're about ready to, uh, I mean, it was like, can, can we even finish them? That, that was the thing is like, I, I had to finish mine and Bill had to finish his and because it was like this manly thing. I'm like, no, we're not going to fail. No, failure is not option. Failure is not, uh, not, not an option. So we both finished them and then we, 
we look at our watches and go, okay, we got to be on stage in like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you could feel it all the way down. You could feel it in your chest. Then you felt it in your stomach. Then you oh. felt it in your bowels. Oh. Then you felt it coming out. I mean, it came out that fast. And it was brutal. It was brutal. We brought a trash can on stage. I brought a trash can and laid it, put it right out in the middle of the stage and said, I might be needing this later on in the show. Because that was <laughs> so I mean it, it yeah. I mean, I I I'll I'll I, I will accept the challenge before you can <laughs> Okay, so now if you if you wanna if you wanna up the ante for Bill, I also have a Carolina Reaper sauce that is an off the menu sauce, and I get it from the same guys that I get all their sauce from. It is so amazingly hot, but it's such a good balanced flavor. But yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll do it, but I probably I probably I learned my lesson. I won't do it either day. Well, I'll do it day of the show, but I won't do it two hours before the show. <laughs> <laughs> There. Timing is everything. <laughs> well, we're coming up to our lightning round questions. So these are kind of like uh, answer. Them. Yeah, don't, don't think too much about it. Just best yeah. first answers. Shoot. Make a phone. Yeah. All right. So, Milo, what two bands in like, you know, the last while have really caught your attention? They're like really drawing me in. You're like, this band is awesome and it doesn't have to be, you know, one of the big bands that you've always listened to it. If there's uh, someone new, by all means, like throw them out there. <laughs> well, I, I'll throw a couple of different bands out there. And one of some mm -hmm. of them are going to be very familiar to people, but I, but it's like, I, I, there's a band that, everyone knows but that they put a new they put their new record on it's like like i felt like i was a return to form like i like the new no effects record okay so i you know they they i loved the stuff they did you know, back in the 90s and and uh oh yeah i loved you know so long thanks for the shoes was one of my favorite by them and then they had some records that i liked but didn't love and then i felt like i kind of lost track of them but the new record that they did really i mean for me it's like one of their best records and it's uh you know they 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 are kind of they're writing like full fledged songs and they and the thing about Mike is that he's I call him the punk rock Tom Lehrer and Tom Lehrer was this guy who had this these amazing he's a guy from way back in the fifties and sixties who had these amazing funny lyrics no one writes a funny lyric like Fat Mike I mean he he writes the funny lyrics ever and he really nailed it on this record so okay that's one you know. People are gonna be like groan, groan because he's old because it's an old it's a, not a new band. But I think it's a the no. new record that they did is just great. Uh, Teenage Fan Club's new record, love Teenage Fan Club's new. Or sorry, not, not Teenage Fan. Sorry, Teenage Bottle Rocket. See, that's I was I picked that. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan's where yeah. my teenage is wrong. Teenage yeah. Bottle Rocket, that new record, Six Sesh, love it. Um, they wrote a song on there where you're listening and it's like. You're my friend, little guy, you're my dude. And you go, oh, he wrote that about his son. Yeah. No, he wrote about a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good, it's so good. Cause you read the lyrics like, oh dude, he, he wrote about a squirrel. So you, you just, I gotta give him props for that. Um, <laughs> this band that, uh, that I only recently got uh, into, they've been around a while, but, uh, uh they they put out uh uh this record last year what was it called glow on um uh mm. it's uh shit why i'm okay i'm drawing a blank turnstile oh. turnstile yeah of course turnstile yeah um turnstile's great uh uh and they they kind of blew me away with that one i think that they're more of a hardcore band except that what they're doing now with the glow on it's like to me, it sounds like the Bad Brains. I mean, Bad Brains circa uh, circa Eye Against Eye, mm -hmm. right. uh, and so if you like Eye Against Eye, you can hear, you can listen to Glow on, and be like, oh yeah, they're ripping off, they're ripping off the Bad Brains. Cool, okay. <laughs> and then I like this band, the Pears. Their Pears are from uh, yeah, the Pears North are great. Orleans. They're from New Orleans, and they just have a good, 
they kind of hit that for me, that sweet spot of like extremely aggressive, fast music with, but with a ton of melody in there and just quirky, very quirky. They're not, they're not, they're not willing to just write the standard, the standard punk rock song. It's gotta, it's gotta be, it's gotta have some time signature changes and some, and some like in your face guitar and this kind of stuff. So yeah, I really like the pairs too. So I guess that, that, that pretty much covers it. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, I you say Tom Lehrer, and all I hear in my head is Poisoning Pigeons in the Park. I mean, oh, I love that song. Like that, right? It's just it's, yeah. it like starts playing in my head. But um, oh yeah, I used know. to I I I used to listen to all that Tom Lehrer <laughs> stuff. I didn't, and that, actually Carl in the band, he and I he and I totally like bond over over Tom, Tom Lehrer for sure. Yeah, well, my geek side was such a huge Doctor Demento fan that like yeah. you know, Poisoning Pigeons in the Park was a staple of Doctor Demento. Oh, but, yeah. Um, I, I guess that could kind of be, you know, poisoning pigeons in the park could kind of be a societal issue. Um, but, uh, you know, of all the societal issues that are out there and all the causes and foundations and charities that are doing such good work out there, what would you say is the one that's kind of in your crosshairs? Like, who, who would you promote today if, if you said go and, and support a volunteer, spend money with you? Who's the, 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 who, who's the one that you would go to? Well, I, I've, We've done we've we've done some uh, kind of a benefit work for places like ACLU and all that. Um, we did that song uh, "Who We Are," and that was all kind of contributed to ACLU and uh, Planned Parenthood and stuff. And that's all that seemed to make sense for that song. But I think. What I've just been uh, really worried about, and and you know this may be maybe over, over maybe overly worried. Maybe my wife would say I'm overly worried, but I, I don't think I'm overly worried. But I just feel like democracy is kind of uh, kind of in the in the balance. Democracies. I mean, it just seems like it's something right now that in this country there's too many warning signs of 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 anti-democratic uh, movements. You got the January 6th thing that happened and that was literally like, the idea was like, fuck democracy. We, 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 don't, we don't believe in democracy. We, we'd rather just have our guy win regardless of what the people want. I mean, yep. I mean I'm sure people could come, come at me with some opposite perspective, but Let's just no. face reality. You know, real, reality is reality, and truth is truth. And I think people are really not are not are not. Uh, that's an important to me. That's an important thing. So if you deal in reality, and if you deal in truth, then you need to be able to deal with the fact that dem that the democracy happened, and democracy needs to continue to happen. And any effort to kind of erase democracy to me is a is a really a step into the dark ages. And that's kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. So I, I mean the, I, you asked about actual like uh, organizations or nonprofits and whatnot. There are there are some nonprofits that deal specifically with this issue of uh, of making sure that democracy doesn't die essentially. Uh, you know, and, and that's that was the, these are these are nonprofits that only kind of got started within the past few years because of the increasing danger of, of what's happening. Uh, uh, in that realm. I mean, it's, so I just, it's maybe not the most exciting, it's not the most exciting thing to kind of, to kind of put on, to kind of, to say where we want to, you know, support this, but I think it's, it's, it's important. And that's probably where I, where I've spent a lot of my last few years reading and, uh, and just trying to kind of uh, sound the alarm as best I can. Um, and yeah, maybe I'm chicken little or whatever, but you know, <laughs> no, 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 you're not, you're not <laughs> support, support democracy. But you got uh, what Southern poverty law centers working overdrive right now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, well, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, look at what's happening in my, my case, my nation's capital right now. Like there is, you know, it's started out as a, a protest. And now it's become an illegal occupation. 
in Ottawa because, you know, because people can understand, hey, these are the people we put in charge because we chose them or whatever. And uh, basically what they're saying is like, be a fucking human and try and, you know, protect your brother humans. And everybody else is like, well, I'm maybe I'm getting a little too political here, <laughs> but it's like, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm seeing like all these people going like, well, it's my right not to do this. Well, that's fine. It's your right not to do that, but it's also your right not to cross that border either. And, you know, there's lots of other jobs you can do. And, you know, democracy has put into effect these laws that are saying you got to do this and you should do this because it's it's just common sense. It's it's yeah. human nature. Like, I think I mean people. I think there's this this notion that that people get to have unlimited rights. So like I get all I want all my rights, but I don't want any responsibility along with right. that. I just want the rights, but none mm -hmm. of the responsibility. But with rights come responsibilities, obviously, and so that's where you end up with, you know. This, this notion of like, you know, my body, you know, freedom. I have freedom to say, you know, not not get vaccinated or whatever. Yeah. If yeah I have freedom absolutely. not to wear a mask, but I don't want the response. I don't, I don't want to have any responsibility for the consequences to the rest of, you know. Yeah, people yeah around exactly. So, and, yeah. and the way I look at it, I'm fine if... Well, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I'm fine if you don't want to get vaxxed or you don't want to wear a mask. That's totally good. Totally fine by me. But you still have to abide by everything that's being thrown out at you for rules and regulations like you're choosing not to actually help society. So unfortunately, yeah. you're going to have to deal with the consequences. It's there. Uh, yeah. All right. I'll stop. <laughs> if I don't stop, I'll go for like fucking three hours. I can't. Shut up, Fletcher. Passion, man. Passion. It's not a bad thing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Churchy's itching. <laughs> Number one rule to pit is when someone falls, you pick them back up. Uh, what would be a rule that you would add to that, Milo? Someone falls, you get they get back up. They get back up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, rules of the pit. Like I feel like you know, there's there's a lot of there's there's, there's falling. But there's also just people getting like crushed on the front and the front at the front end. I mean, I feel like uh, I feel like uh, there ought to be a buffer somehow. I mean, like where where people aren't getting like because you know there's the, there was that concert where everyone just basically got suffocated. You know, so it's one thing to fall and not get back up, but it's another thing just to get like the the life crushed out of you. Like you know, so I mean the, that that would be like something that I think like, you know, maybe, maybe uh, give people space. I mean, if best you can, it's a pit. So are you talking about boundaries? Boundaries are good. We like boundaries. Boundaries are good. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, also that, you know, what I also feel like the people at the very front of the stage, you got like all these people right there on the, at the front, they're not looking to kind of get all like uh rad, mm -hmm. but they're, but they're, they're getting their backs, you know, they're, they're getting uh, people's people behind them crushing into them. So I feel like uh, that's something where they need to, uh, you know, we take, take care of those people in front. I mean, a lot of the people in front just came to see the band. When I used to go see a band, I would just plant myself at the very front of the stage and, and be like, 
totally focused on the band and not worry so much about what's going on behind me. And uh, mm. I think that there's that that's probably like people need to kind of realize that some people are just there to see the band and not to kind of get their get their brains beat out, you know. So yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been on totally. both ends of that spectrum there to at the front just to watch the band and be mesmerized, you know, by a good performance. I've gotten gnarly in the pit too, you know, and like, but you help someone up that falls, whatever. And I've also been the old guy that just stands at the back by the bar with a glass of water. And yeah, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but my problem is that when I'm on stage, I, I'm so kind of locked into what I'm doing. I feel like, I feel like I have, maybe I have a responsibility to, to make sure that people don't uh, don't beat each other up, it's hard. You know, and you know that one, that one, like I said, that one concert where um, was it Travis Scott, I guess, and and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I think it's hard to know from his perspective uh, how much of it was he aware of. Now, obviously, if he was aware of things, he's in the position to stop the show. But I can tell you that when I'm up on stage, I'm not aware of that stuff a lot of times. I'm so locked into what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I, this, this, that's the only way I can really operate. I can't, I can't go up on stage and think, okay, I got to spend half my time monitoring what's going on, you know, <laughs> uh, making sure that no one's dying out there. You know, I'm just right. doing my thing. Um, and this is not in any way kind of, you know, you know, you know, letting him off the hook or anything like that, but just that, I just know that as a performer, sometimes you're just not aware of all the bullshit that's going on down there. So, yeah. yeah. So Milo, um, before we finish off, we, we do have a fan question. And uh, if it's cool with you, we'll, uh, we'll share that with you now and uh, go from there. Hi, Milo. It's Crispin here. In the face of the global pandemic, do you ever consider a return to biochemistry? If not, do you at least keep up with new and emerging studies and research in that field? Um, just something I was thinking about. Thanks a lot. Big fan. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I, I don't have any plans to return to it. I my my time at uh, the last job I had wasn't in, in science was at DuPont and I had some great years there but I also the last few years there were uh, not so good I mean miserable at a, on a certain level a little bit miserable and so when I left I was kind of like not looking to kind of go back to it uh, and I'm, st I'm, I'm still kind of in that mode of like eh yeah. I don't think I need to do that. Uh, I'm having so much fun with the band. And, you know, I, I think if I got back into science, I don't exactly know in what capacity I would do that. So I haven't, it hasn't been something that's, that's really been in the forefront of my mind. Like, oh, I'm going to, you know, even go back to that. Um, I'll occasionally just see what's going on in the science field. I mean, part, part of, part of me trying to keep tabs on that is because whenever you, whatever projects that I was working on back then, they always, they, they always kind of ended up kind of never read, they never end up reaching their not logical, their logical conclusion. It's like you're doing them and you get some, you get some answers, but you never get the final answer. That's the way science works. You get, you get little hints at an answer and then maybe then, maybe then you're done and you move on to something else. But then there's all right. these, dangling, there's all these dangling questions that never got answered. And sometimes I'll go back, reread the lit or read the new literature to see if anyone's updated the story because uh i always feel like you know i i feel like i you, you have that those burning questions like i i really wanted to know uh, uh what the result was going to be and i never got to it and so i'll go back and see if anyone else has picked up the thread and whether anyone's furthered that story along in that particular area that to me is the, has has more in, has the most interest is, is just trying to figure out because uh, those are the, those were the burning questions that I dealt with back then. And so, yeah. Okay. Oh, good. All right. So as a fellow scientist, you know, as you just mentioned, we're always searching for solutions, right? Answers. Um, and so, and we've talked about this already, how 
we're certainly living in what people would maybe call crazy times. Um, the world is certainly full of unrest, lots of different things happening than we would say status quo. So I'm interested what you think the role of punk in the current world is. How can punk help make the world better? Well, um, I feel like uh, part of punk is like always questioning, you know, and that's part of what the scientists would do as well. So there's this, there's this link between what you would do as a scientist. You're always questioning the status quo. And because that's that, you know, describing, doing an experiment to kind of flesh out a particular part of science is really just saying, well, here's what people think is the answer, but but let let's actually figure out what the answer is. Let's let's design the experiment with this appropriate hypothesis to get to the answer. And that's so that's that's a questioning of the status quo. And it turns out that's kind of what punk is good good at too. I mean, I think part of what punk should be doing is questioning the status quo. And uh, and if that means you gotta you have to kind of knock over the apple cart then that that that's what's going to have to happen and so i think uh that's probably one of the most important things about punk and you know we 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 we've uh as a band we steered clear of a lot of the kind of really overtly political stuff however uh you know in the past few years we i put out I, we put out a few uh singles and i'll take responsibility for those because the band because the band's like okay it's on you now <laughs> because you're the political one. I've, I've been the one kind of driving the more political songs that we've done recently. It's not like something we're planning on continuing, like, oh, we're just going to become this political band. But I felt like I had something to say. I felt like I had something I had to get off my chest. And, you know, politics be damned, whether, you know, I, you know half of our fans may as well, half of our fans may as well be right wing and half of our fans may as well be left wing. I don't know what the split is, but I thought I just got to get this off my chest and I don't give a fuck who, who we lose in the process. And that's part of, part of challenging the status quo and, or just part of like, not, you know, not caring what the ramifications are, just, just doing it and just, and just kind of like getting it off your chest. And that was, that was part of what uh, those were all about. It was just like, you know, not not kind of like laying out some manifesto for the band, but just more like this is this is this is what I feel and this is what's gonna, gonna happen. So that's another thing that punk's good at is that you know, you uh, you you challenge the status quo, but also you don't you just don't give a fuck who who you don't give a fuck what people think. And you just if you got something to say, you say it without without thinking about the ramifications. Um Amen. Yeah. Yeah, punk rock gives a shit about some things, but a lot of other things we just don't give a fuck about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get we give a shit about not giving a shit. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Well, this has been absolutely uh, stellar again, honestly. And that's what I was gonna. I, we were uh, gonna come out. Go, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and say because this is actually our take two with. with <laughs> um, but this actually demonstrates what what rules of the pit means for us is that we help each other out when we felt when we fall our computers decided it was going to take a shit and milo reached out and picked us up and let us do it again so we really 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 appreciate that yeah absolutely. Well, it's, it's your, you so it's your inaugural one right this is the first one yeah this is this going to be the first, first one, one. And, and 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 it dumped on us and it was just a you know just the absolute <laughs> and <perfect>. it was, <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, yeah to, yeah broke my heart man it broke my heart <laughs> i try again so can we can we can, uh, so you know i know you don't want to get too political you guys you try but i just gotta ask this question real quick do you plan on making uh, writing any songs about eating documents about eating documents <laughs> <laughs> i mean somebody's gotta be out there yeah doing some paper. i don't know what he got out of it but whatever yeah so cool. appreciate it yeah. beautiful all right That's thank good. you Thank well, you very much. thank you very much, Milo. Uh, <laughs> again, thank <laughs> you. And so, uh, we couldn't be more happier to have this you on our work, show. Right? I 